Now let's, let's start with neural machine translation, okay? We have seen language modeling, which is quite related to neural machine translation. It's like the previous step to that. Now uh, let's go into to see this, uh, this uh, neural machine translation application. As before, I'm going to make an overview of the problem of machine translation, okay? The, the, the way it has been approached uh, before deep learning came in. And then I'm going to focus on how it's uh, solved nowadays with neural machine trans with with a neural approach, which is the state of the art at the moment. Okay. So previous concepts as before that we need the recurrent neural uh, network, the words embeddings, and also the language modeling that we have teach. Okay. So background of machine translation. Again, who is familiar with machine translation? No? Language modeling, at least. Okay. Uh, a little bit, yeah? What, what are you doing, or what do you know no, about I machine translation? Uh, I was working in neural network uh, last semester, so I, but I worked on the fragmentation, so what I know about, I, I know about uh, machine translation is just reading papers. I am not worried about that. Ah, okay, but well, at least you, about neural, you said, eh? not the other translation, or about yeah, neural. neural. Um, oh, it's, uh, see, it's okay. I was looking at this what record. Okay, so uh, to make uh, you have this this overview of machine translation, uh, machine translation. This is the typical pyramid, the the, the backwards pyramid of, of of translation, where it shows. It's very little, but that's why I'm going to read it. Here you have the source text, which is the the language that you have at the input. Here you, at the bottom you have the target text and you can go, you, your objective is going from the source text which might be English to the target text which might be French for example. So translating from English to, to French and you can go directly or you can go for example through an interlingua. The, the idea is that you in the interlingua you do an analysis of the source text, a grammatical analysis, a semantic analysis, a morphological analysis and you represent your input language into some um, universal representation, and from this universal representation, you generate a, 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 a target text, okay? Or you can go directly from the source without doing any kind of analysis, or you can do in the middle an approach that is doing uh, some little analysis, but not as exhaustive and in, as the Indian interlingua, and then you, by some rules or something, you do a transfer from the from this source analyzed uh, text, and you generate the, the, the text, okay? One approach is the rule-based approach, that it's basically a transfer-based approach here in the middle. It's not an interlingua, it's not a direct approach. And the idea is that you do some morphological analysis and some syntactic analysis of the source language, and then you have some rules, manually designed rules, and then you generate the target language, okay? These systems work uh, pretty well, but they need to be developed for uh, quite, uh, quite a few years. So normally when these systems work well is that they have been developed 30 years or something like that. Okay, so, um, but uh, the, good, the good thing of these systems is that you know which errors to expect and how to solve them, because you, there is normally a rule assigned to, to, to each error, no? so you, you know where to go to solve the, the issue. So there are these commercial co uh, companies that commercialize with these systems. In fact, uh, I, I did some research in, in, in Singapore, and when they told me when I arrived, they said, okay, here we have the rule-based system for selling, and the statistical-based system, at the time it was statistical, not neural, the statistical based system to publish. Okay, so to know about that. Uh, the statistical approach, here we have a diagram. Uh, it seems complex, but no, uh, it's not com com complex at all. I just want you to, to have the general idea. And the thing is that you start from a parallel corpus, okay? A parallel corpus is, uh, you have the sentence in the original language and the corresponding correct translation in, in the target language, okay? So this is a supervised task, 
uh, all the time we are talking about supervised uh, tasks and as in language modeling. And you have these this, this, this two sentences and you have thousands, millions of these sentences, okay? And what you extract is first the word alignment because you have the sentences aligned but you don't have the words aligned. And how you do that? Simply by co-occurrence, okay? You count. And if, if there are a lot of sentences that have a boy a comprar has appeared and I will buy has appeared, you know that, uh, well, that comprar and buy are aligned, no? If every time that appears comprar appears buy, you know that this has a high probability of, of, of being a, a, a word correspondence, okay? From that, you, extra, you do a phrase extraction and you build your translation model. What does it mean, a phrase extraction? The, the idea of this translation model is that you don't have only words aligned to words, okay? You have also segments of words which are called phrases, okay? Sequences of words, okay? S sequences of words, like two or three words that correspond to the sentence of two or three words, okay? And you build your dictionary here, okay? It's a dictionary with probabilities. This is the main model of this statistical approach. Then you have your language model, which you already know how to build a language model. You, need, you have a monolingual corpus, and, and the model ensures that the translated words are, uh, come in, in the right order and are uh, probable in that language, okay? You combine these two models. There are more models, but I'm not going to enter into the detail to translate, here is the test part, to translate your source language, okay? And there is a decoding that combining these two models given a source sentence finds the most probable sentence, uh, the most probable translation sentence, okay? This is a big picture of the statistical model. This statistical model is the one that was implemented in Google before 2016, where Google introduce the deep neural network in, uh, in, in, in production, okay? So to make you an idea, this statistical model was running from 2007, more or less, I guess, till 2016, okay? Before, before 2007, Google was uh, using a rule-based system. Uh, I, I, I think it was the Systrans system, okay? After 2007, it was using the, the statistical one. Uh, okay, so here are the motivations to try a new approach, okay? It's, okay, the statistical systems work pretty well. In fact, we can discuss this later, but they still work better than the neural machine translations for some applications, uh, for some particular cases. But the motivations to change from statistical to neural is that in, in the statistical based system, for example, we are optimizing separately the word alignment and the translation, okay? So this is a, a, a drawback because, because in fact, when, when you Im improved the word alignment, uh, the, it, this wasn't correlated necessarily with the improvement of translation, okay? So that that's, 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 that's a big problem. Um, uh, also, the, main, the, the motivation is the one that I have explained for language modeling, no? okay? In translation, in general, in statistical machine translation, each word was independent from each other, okay? So if you have seen house in your, uh, in your, in your training, thousand times, lots of times, I don't know, and you have seen houses only one time, houses is very low represented, okay? And you don't know how to, tra well, you, you, know, you might know how to translate houses, but it, 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 it might be not the correct one because, I don't know, it was in a, in, a, in a translation or whatever. If you do some clustering of words, some word embedding, uh, you know that houses is kind of related with house and you can uh, do your translation better. No? So it's again the idea of word embedding to get uh, the advantage of it. And yeah, uh, looking further, which is still not solved, is the idea that, okay, with statistical machine translation, we have a nice system, but we have 
uh, pairs of systems, okay? So in a highly multilingual uh, environment like the European one, where you have 23 or 25 official languages, whatever, you, you have to translate, to build uh, 25 per 24 uh, systems to have the translation be among all translation pairs, okay? With the approach that I have shown of the interlingua, the idea is that you translate your English to an interlingua and from that interlingua you translate to any other languages. I, I, in this case, the systems that you have to build get reduced to two per the number of languages, okay? Because you have to build uh, the language, one, uh, language to interlingua and interlingua to language. So it's not pair to pair, so you reduce the number of systems, okay? So this is, okay. So uh, in a statistical machine translation, it's impossible to think about that unless you, you, be, well, you, you, have, you build, you, you have an, an interlingual language like Esperanto that works well, and you, well. With the approach that we're going to show, it seems that you can try to build an automatic uh, interlingua, okay? That, that, that would be uh, an objective and a motivation to change the paradigm, okay? So, the motivations are having an integrated MT paradigm that it's not independent, the word alignment and the translation model, that it's trainable mm, not only from the, from the word part, uh, that you can train characters, that you can train subwords, that you can, this we are going to explain as well, and that you can train clusters of words uh, with word embedding and things like this. And having multilingual advantages, okay? What do we need uh, in to build a neural machine translation system? We need a parallel corpus. This was needed as well in a statistical machine translation, okay? The parallel corpus is this, the correspondence between source sentences and target sentences, okay? That is why we're saying that we are training a supervised system. There are plenty of parallel corpus available. Here's just some ones that are really big ones. Okay, so this is not a problem. Well, depending. If you want to train Chinese Catalan, there are not plenty of parallel corpus Chinese Catalan, no. Okay, so there are plenty if you want to do experiments, no matter the language. If you are targeting at one particular language, then it starts to be there starts to be problems, okay? But to train your own system, you can, you can do it. What else do we need? We need a me an automatic measure to evaluate our system, okay? Uh, the automatic measure that we are currently using in, in, in machine translation is the BLEU, which evaluates you, you, what you have is your output, okay? The, your system translates a sentence and you have this output, and you have the right sentence written by a human person, no? and you evaluate how many uh, words uh, corresponds from your output to the objective sent sentence, okay? And you count the, the precision of unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, and foregrams. Normally, blue is at the foregram level, okay? That's what you need for a neural, uh, to build a neural machine translation system, okay? And of course, the change from statistical machine translation to neural machine translation has not been like this. Okay, we changed the paradigm. It, it has been gradual, no? So first, approaches were uh, about uh, integrating, and I was involved in this one in 2006. I'm happy, proud to say that with, with uh, Holger Sveng. We, he is now at Facebook. Uh, the idea was uh, to combine uh, the statistical, to introduce neural language models in uh, a statistical machine translation system, okay? We did that by rest scoring, okay? So that was one of the first ways to introduce neural in uh, machine translation. Then the second one, this, the first one was with rest scoring. The second approach was integration directly in the decoding, okay? So, so the neural language model was integrated in the decoder. And finally, going directly an end-to-end -end system from source to target with a neural network. That is the one that I'm going to explain as follows. Okay, you know this picture. 
sequence modeling, okay? And the model the probability of, the, of awards with a recurrent neural network. Okay, this is language model, we are familiar with this. So how do we do that when we have two sentences? Okay, uh, the idea is that we use two recurrent neural networks, okay? One in the, what we call the encoder, and another one, what we call the decoder, okay? So we have an encoder, this seems, we are going to enter into detail, don't get scared by this picture, okay? But uh, we have here the input sentence, the source, the sentence that we want to translate, and we compress this sentence into a vector, okay, that uh, it's called uh, the thought vector, sometimes, uh, well, it's, it's the representation of the sentence in general, and from this representation of the sentence, which is a single vector, we use it as input for the recurrent neural network of the decoder, okay? And we uh, output the, uh, uh, the translation sentence, okay? So it's, it's this, we, are, we have the source sentence, we make a representation of that source sentence, and from that representation, we output the uh, translation sentence, okay? Here it's more clear, I guess. Um, your input sentence, your thought or context vector, that is the input of your recurrent neural network from the decoder, okay? And based on that, on that, on that, on that vector, you uh, output your translation, okay? Let's see the, the encoder in detail. Uh, we have this, this is just like a language model, okay? It's just what you get, well, similar in the sense. You have the input sentence, you do a 1K encoding, what we, what we saw, to uh, put our words in, in this highly multidimensional uh, uh, space. From this highly multidimensional space, we reduce the dimensionality by using words embeddings, but making a, a, a continuous space representation, okay? And from that representation, we use a recurrent neural network to compress our sentence into, into a vector, okay? So we have this. And this, sorry about that, because it's the same slides as before. So uh, this one, the, the 1K encoding, this is different. Uh, this is the embedding. You have this matrix that is the one that you are training, and here you have your 1K uh, vector, and this you multiply this matrix that you are training by the by the vector, and you do the reduction of dimensionality. That this is the the new vector that you are going to enter to the recurrent neural network. Okay. This is just the, the word there. Okay. Ah, yeah. Given the representations of each word, do you have a representation of the full sentence or not? Uh, depending. Uh, in this case, yes. In this case, it's the objective. Or the, depends. Uh, uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, I mean, no, but there are some recurrent neural networks that output the probability at each hidden state. Oh, so, uh, in this case, yeah. In this case, yeah. You, you have to represent the, the entire sentence into a vector. And <laughs> this is the objective of the so, recurrent neural network. Um, do sentences get represented as vectors in the same dimensionality as words? And in this case, um, do you can can you find some meaning in having words and sentences in the same space? I mean, ah, uh, yeah, no, no, it's it's it's. I, for I example, mean. when you have words, everything in uh, one hundred dimension. Um, so you had this relation between um, subtracting the words. Yeah, um, do you the words. If you encode the sentence in the same space via uh, an RNN or some model. Do you get, get, for example, I don't know, the vector of the sentence being somehow in the middle of the concept in the sentence, or you, you don't get any? Uh, no, I mean, what you, and I don't know if I have the picture here. Uh, da, 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 ah, yeah. Here you have, for example, 
what what you might have seen, no, that it's this that the, the plot that the, the plot of this vector uh, of this sentence representation uh, with uh, the visualization the standard T S N E, okay, uh, tool. Uh, what you get is here the the representation of the sentences and you the, the ones that that we are targeting with this recurrent neural network. And you see that similar sentences go to similar parts of the, of the space. No? So she was given a card by me in the garden. In the garden, I gave her a card. Okay? So these, these sentences are quite similar. But it's not what, what you are asking. I mean, it's, uh, this is the representation of sentences. And it's the space of the representation of sentences, which is different from the representation of words. But I'm not, uh, I mean, maybe there is such a word that tries to match sentences and words. Eh? But it's not in this case. But you could make a sentence with just one word and then make it pass to the. Uh, yeah. Then, but then you will get. But then you don't, I mean, you don't see, yeah, but the RNN does only have one state, no? I mean, you only have one word or well, a Translate into a sentence vector, no? Yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah, but. Maybe it has some relationship with the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, in any case, it's an interesting thing, uh, but uh, at the moment I cannot say how, how is it solved in the, in, the, in the literature. But the idea is here is that words embedding are in one site, and, and here the, the recurrent neural network plots the, the, the center. Going back, no, we were here. Okay, just so. okay. So once we have done the embedding, what we do is the the compression into into this vector through the recurrent neural network, okay? There, over there, you have the formula of recurrency where it depends uh, on the input uh, word, continuous representation, and on the uh, previous hidden state, okay? Uh, this recurrency, as you know, it's not, uh, it's not solved through vanilla uh, uh, recurrent neural networks. It's necessary, mandatory, to use l LSTMs or GRUs or any type of gating units, okay? Not, not, you don't try to do this with vanilla RNNs. Using one or the other, for example, LSTM or GRUs, more or less performs the same. Uh, and there are some words that compare both of them and depends on the task, one works better, the other, but more or less it's the same. But you don't try to do this with vanilla LSTM. And the decoder. Once we have this vector, this summary vector, it's this summary vector is the input to our uh, recurrent neural network from the decoder, okay? And uh, we decode words with this summary vector, HT, with the previous hidden state, and with the, pre with the previous output uh, uh, word, okay? This is the, the, pa uh, the, the input to decide which is to go going to be our uh, next uh, translated word, okay? So the internal state depends on the summary vector, the previous word, and the previous internal state, okay? Uh, to our score, from the word that we are going to put uh, as, as, as more probable uh, depends on this dot product. If we do not look at the bias, the idea is that the more similar, uh, you know that the dot product is a way of computing similarity, okay? So if my word, the one that, I, that I'm using at that moment, and the internal state of the decoder is similar, my word is, is the, 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 
the more similar they are, that the higher the dot product is, which is the more similar they are, uh, the more probable it is going to be that word. Okay? This is the score, or the score of the word in the vocabulary that I'm going to output as a target word. Okay? And this is the intuition behind what I'm saying, no? that you are making this dot product that the higher it is, the higher is my probability. Okay? This is the way to score the words and to decide which target word comes next. Okay? And then this score is transformed again with a softmax into a probability. Okay? So we can finally normalize the, the, the word probabilities with a softmax. Here, the higher is the, the, our vocabulary, the more expensive is this uh, part, of course, because we have more words to normalize. This sum is bigger. And this softmax is uh, 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 the, the one of the computational restric restrictions of, of this uh, neural machine translation system. Okay, and, and the first uh, neural machine translation that they appeared has had to limit the vocabulary because of this and in this sense they were behind state of the art but nowadays there are some techniques like character based models subword models where your vocabulary is reduced and you can face this problem and it's not an issue anymore this vocabulary limitation not with nowadays systems it was at the beginning but it's not anymore Okay, so and once we have the new word, we go back to the first step until it appears the end of sentence word. Okay, so this is, of course, we, we go through uh, decoding until we get the end of sentence. Yeah. Uh, exactly, until we get the end of sentence. Uh, how do we perform this training? So we use a maximum likelihood estimation. It's, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a supervised problem. And we start with, okay, our sentence uh, has this, our input sentence has this output sentence. And what we, we, we compute is the probability of uh, having the target sentence given a source sentence, okay? And we want to maximize its log likelihood uh, knowing uh, having uh, the, the, the training pace that, that, that we have, okay? So we prepare the parallel corpus, uh, given the pair of sentence, we compute the log linear probability and we maximize this log likelihood probability, okay? So this is how we perform the training. This is just for you to have, I'm not going to go through it, but it's the computational complexity. You can look it up, uh, after the class. The computational uh, complexity of this uh, machine translation system that we that we have. That's why you need GPUs. Okay, you need GPUs because you are dealing with vectors and matrices, and GPUs perform really good, uh, really efficiently with vectors and matrices, and this cannot be done with CPUs. Okay, that's to, to make you. Clear. Okay, question. Why this nice end-to-end -end system might not work? Not enough data to train the system. It could be, but no. <laughs> or a small batch of the sentence. Nice. Is that? Exactly. Exactly. You are squeezing a long sentence into, a, into one vector. No matter the length of your sentence, you are always going into one vector repre fixed representation. And that's, that's a problem. That's, that's the thing, no? Um, that's the answer. And uh, how to solve this with the attention-based mechanism, okay? The idea is that we want to model uh, this translation as we do humans, no? that we put attention to different parts of the sentence depending on the part of the sentence that we are translating. We are not memorizing the entire sentence and then translating, okay? No. So the idea is to follow like, like this. No? And it's to put this attention depending on the part that we are translating. How do we do that, okay? 
so instead of encoding the source sentence into a set into into a single vector we encode the source sentence into a set of context vectors okay so we use instead of having one fixed representation now we are going to have a matrix representation that for each word uh, uh, it has for each word that we are decoding it has a context vector depending on the word that I'm th that I'm translating I put emphasis on one uh, on word one from the input or on word three from the input or whatever okay so I have a set of context vectors this is the idea behind translation okay so this this diagram that I have all, uh, uh, already shown is this that shows you that okay the fixed representation plots similar sentences into similar places of the diagram which is interesting but uh, it fails to do so when uh, sentences are pretty long and whatever the attention allows to put to use multiple vectors based on the length of the input okay so depending on the length of the input um, I'm, I'm using multiple multiple vectors so the ones that have attended to the other classes are already familiar with the attention key ideas uh, but I'm going to repeat them uh, it's not uh, it's always nice we encode each word in the input and the output sentence into a vector when decoding we perform a linear combination of these vectors weighted by the attention weights and we use this combination in picking up the next word okay so what we how we compute this attention with these key ideas we have the query vector and the key vector the query vector is normally the decoder hidden state and the key vector is normally the encoder hidden state and for each query key pay, uh, pair we calculate a weight okay which is this one and this one is normalized to get a probability okay so we know how similar the query vector is with the key vector and the more similar they are the, the higher is the weight for that key uh, for that key vector okay the higher the weight the higher the probability with these weights we multiply the value vectors that normally are initialized with the key vectors okay and we update them into the context vector okay and this is going to be the input uh, exactly here in the context this is going to be the input uh, instead of having the fixed uh, vector this context vector is going to be the one that I'm using for translating each word in the decoder okay so this context vector varies depending on the word that I'm translating okay and that's the key that's the thing that I'm putting different different context vectors depending on the word that I'm translating okay and this depends on the similarity of the word of the hidden uh, decoder and hidden state deco decoder state and the uh, hidden encoder state okay this, uh, this similarity um, it's, it's uh, computed in the context vector and allows us to have this this mechanism uh, is really powerful and it's really used in many applications and well there are different ways ways to compute this this uh, this uh, attention uh, function one of them is through multiple layer perception which was the one that was uh, firstly proposed uh, this is trainable uh, and you have the weight matrix and the, the hyperbolic tangent it's flexible it works well for neural machine translation and in fact it, this was the Badanao et al 2015 was the first system that uh, scored better than the statistical machine translation system okay this was the first uh, proof that the neural could work better than the statistical based system okay then there is a bilinear approximation the dot product uh, that is not 
like this is not trainable, but, but you add some linear layers to make it trainable, and then the scale dot product that makes it, normalize it uh, by the length of the vector. Okay, that it's the latest approach, and it's the one that it's, uh, I'm going to talk about that later, which is called the transformer, and it's the state of the art nowadays in, in machine translation. Okay, improvements in attention related to uh, machine translation. Uh, who was here this morning, by the way? You, you, you. <laughs> you. Okay, <laughs> so you heard about that, but uh, since many of you haven't, uh, I'm going to, to explain it again. Sorry for the ones that were here. Um, but these are different courses, eh? so it's not. <laughs> um, okay, so improvements in translation. The, the problem that appeared in, in very first machine translation systems is that you get the same word repeated once and, uh, over and over again. No? Uh, so, for example, in this sentence, Senor Presidente abre la sesión, you, you can get the translation, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, and you keep translating the same. This happens. Uh, don't ask me why, but the neural networks keep stuck there and keeps until the end of the sentence comes, and you can, here I have written three times Mr. President, but you can have it 15 times. Okay, this happens. So the idea is to have a model that tells you that one source word has been already covered so that you don't translate it again. Okay, this information can be added in, in, in the attention so that you do not repeat words or so that you do not forget to translate words from the input, okay? So this is the idea behind this coverage approach. Then you can incorporate also Markov properties. So the idea is that the attention in translation from your previous word uh, it's not independent from the attention that, that you are, uh, that from the current word, no? So you can use this information uh, to, to improve your, your, your attention mechanism, no? That the, the idea that, that, that language is sequence and, and the attention that you put in the previous word is going to be related to attention that you are in the current word, okay? The, the, the mark of properties. Then the bidirectional training. Okay, so uh, that you do attention from left to right and to right from right to left, no? So in the in the two directions, this is see, this idea is taken from as, as many other ideas from the statistical machine translation approach, for example, where you perform word alignment in one direction and in the other direction. Okay, so here it's more or less the same idea. You do the attention from uh, German to English and from English to German. And then you combine both of them. Uh, supervised training. Okay, if you have, what happens if you have some texts that are aligned at the level of words? You can take this as information uh, for your uh, attention based mechanism, which at the end is kind of alignment between words. Okay, you can take advantage of this. And then this nice paper, which uh, if you are interested in the topic, you should uh, read. Attention is all you need is, is, is the new approach that appeared uh, last year. This year, last year already, we last year, in 2017, last year, last year in June. Okay, and, and the idea, the motivation behind it is that, okay, this, these systems that, that I have presented are really nice. This encoder, decoder with attention, they have al already bet the statistical machine translation system, perfect, but uh, they have a, a problem, for example. They, they are recurrent, okay? They, they follow a sequence, they use recurrent neural networks, and they cannot be easily parallelized, no? And that doesn't like, Google doesn't like this because they have a lot of powerful, uh, uh, powerful, computing resources and they need parallelization. So they, they, the, the main motivation was this, no? The idea that they design an architecture that can be easily parallelized and use their powerful TPUs more than, which is more than GPUs and, 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 and they can train their systems faster with their data. Um, 
Okay, so for that they propose the transformer. And the idea is that they use, instead of using recurrent neural networks, which already some months ago, this was in June, and I don't know if in April it was that Facebook proposed some uh, systems with the same idea, but uh, they use convolutional neural networks to build a, the, the translation system. But here they, they use only attention-based mechanisms, okay? And they, the idea is that you build you concatenate several detention mechanisms in parallel to put to, to know from which words you are taking attention to. Okay? It's, this is the idea. No? So for example, um, in, in the standard system that I have shown, there is only a tension between the target sentence and the uh, input sentence, in, and the source sentence. Okay? This is only uh, translation between target and, and source. Here in the transformer, you have intra-attention as well. They, they, they realize that, okay, uh, knowing the dependency between input words, it's also important. No? For example, the bank and river in this case are related. No? So, I mean, uh, I arrive at the bank, it makes sense because it's the bank of the river, so this is going to influence my translation because bank is in the context of river, it's not a bank account, no? Okay? So the idea of doing cell intra-attention, it's important and relevant for translation, no? And this is what the transformer is taking into account. This is the architecture, which is kind of scary. Um, but okay, let's go a little bit so that you get the idea, no? Uh, there are no recurrent neural networks, so in this case, what we have is the input, and this is still an encoder-decoder architecture, okay? Here on the left, we have the encoder, we have the inputs and the encoder, and here on the right, we have the outputs, and all this part is a decoder, okay? You can see it still as an encoder-decoder. Uh, the first steps in the encoder is still the word embedding, but, but we add a positional encoding that was also in this Facebook approach that I told you. Is, this is necessary because since you don't have recurrent neural networks anymore, you don't know where your words are. So that's why you put a positional uh, uh, embedding so that you can keep track of the order of your words. Okay? Then what you get is a module of uh, multi-head attention Okay, that is this one that I told you. If this multi-head attention is basically uh, a dot product attention <laughs> in parallel, like here uh, in the paper it was like eight times, okay? And, and this allows you to put uh, attention to different parts of the sentence. In this case, you are only doing self-attention in this part. Notice that the input is only the the, the input sentence, so you don't have uh, attention across sentences, no, you have attention in the same sentence, but f at the same time you can put attention to different parts of the sentence because you are putting in parallel different attention modules. Then you have a feedforward network that the output of that feedforward network inputs the decoder, but the decoder before that it already had a masked multi-head attention this mass multi-head attention, it was to force that in training, the decoder only focused on, on, on passwords, not on, 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 on forward words, because of course in training you have the input sentence and the output sentence. So you could put attention to, to, uh, to words that you have not uh, translated, but you cannot do that in test time. So to make it training more similar to, well, to, to make it exactly the same, as you're going to have in test, you put this mask multi-head attention where you put attention only to, to, to words and you take into consideration only words that you have translated, not the ones that you don't have translated. And this, the output of this mask attention and the output of the encoder are the input of the multi-head attention, another module of the multi-head attention that works exactly the same but in this case, you have across the input and the output sentence, 
and then you get a feed forward network and a softmax and this is the this is the the, the architecture okay so take into account that you that we have this intra attention self attention uh, uh, advantage in this architecture and the multi head attention to show the picture more in detail is this first the scale dot product attention where we have the, the query vector, the key vector, and the value vector that, that we have talked about. And this is the multi-head uh, uh, concatenation that here we have the scale dot, dot product attention with the linear layers that make it trainable, okay? These are the, uh, the, the linear transformations that, that make our attention trainable, okay? This is what we train in the system. This is the, the, the module. But, okay, this is a big picture. It's difficult to follow. Um, questions right now? Well, uh, uh, it is, uh, it just, I just want you to have some ideas of this, okay? It's just that. At uh, first, there are no recurrency, that you are using only attention-based mechanisms, that you have still the encoder-decoder, that uh, you take advantage of this intra-attention mechanism, okay, that, that, that the idea is that attention in one sentence can, can help you, okay, because I'm going to see, uh, we're going to see an example of this. And well, which is uh, the, the state of the art architecture, this one, okay? These are the results for this, uh, compared to the Google Neural MT system, which was recurrent based, with the convolutional system that I have shown, uh, that I have talked about, that was the one from Facebook, and with the transformer in the English to French uh, task, okay? So the transformer. The, this is the Bleu measure, the higher the better, so, so the transformer performs better. And the idea of the intra-attention, that is what I wanted to put emphasis on, is that it helps in translation. Why? Here we have an example, no? Uh, from translation from English to French, no? The animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. This it refers to what? Refers to animal, okay? So the, the fact that I know that it refers to animal is going to help me in the, in the translation, okay? Because uh, in, in French, uh, the, trans the, the translation would be elle, okay? Feminine, okay? So, but, in, in, in this case, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide. This it refers to the street, okay? So the translation is going to be uh, different, okay? If, if okay, you see what I mean? Depending on what it refers to, my translation can be, the, if the target language has uh, feminine, masculine, uh, has uh, gender flexion, my translation, it, this is going to influence my translation. So this is the advantage and the power of using intra-attention. The information of knowing that it refers to, uh, I don't have, oh no, I don't have part of the, trans the translation, okay? But it's this idea, no? This is the intra-attention the intra diagrams, no? So, so here, it, it was too tired, refers to the animal, and here, it was too white, refers to street. And this information can help me in the translation. That is what we didn't have when using recurrent neural networks with attention. Okay? This is just with attention-based mechanisms with this multi-head attention. Okay? This is the power of this new system, which is really six months old. Seven. Okay? I have already said it, but neural MT is better than phrase-based system, but uh, I told you that sometimes it's not better. 
anyone guessing why sometimes neural machine translation is not better than phrase based system? Uh, you mean that, for example, neural machine translation like it, it translates. Constrained by how much you can represent in a vector. Yeah, exactly. The, in fact, yeah, you are right. The, 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 the sentence length normally when training the neural machine translation mm -hmm. is shorter okay. than the one you are training limiting the phrase based system. Phrase That's based it. Exactly. You train, mm -hmm. well, you limit at the end because then if not, the word alignment with one more than 100 gets lost and all this. but Normally, in general, and you're right, mm -hmm. the phrase-based system doubles the training, dou doubles the, the, the length of the, of the neural. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But um, this, I mean, at the end, this is for training. So you are mm -hmm. kind of losing training sentences. But it's not that the longer sentences neural cannot phase no, it no, right. No. No, it does not. It's that you are losing training mm -hmm. power. But training power that at the end the phrase base cannot take fully advantage as well because the word alignment is not so. So this is not clear, clear advantage. There is one that is I'm looking for that it's more more clear. But maybe well, I'll let you. Well, ten seconds to think about it. Yes. Okay, when we have low resources, okay, the, the phrase-based system does much, in general, you know that deep learning, in general, needs large quantities of data to train. There are a lot of parameters that you have to train, that you have to tune, whatever. So the phrase-based system, let's put numbers. If you have uh, 100,000 uh, sentence, parallel sentences, you better train a phrase-based system than a neural machine translation system. Okay, depends. If the, the task is really uh, closed and you have a low vocabulary, maybe a neural machine translation, maybe, maybe. But no, uh, in general, uh, there is a graphic that you can look uh, that are six challenges for neural machine translation. That is a paper from last year in a workshop of, of ACL from Philip Coin that he states it pretty clearly that uh, the quantity of data from which the neural machine translation is competitive or improving the statistical machine translation system. Okay, so this is this is one clear one clear situation where the phrase-based system is still better than the neural machine translation system. Here, uh, I should have updated this. This uh, we could have uh, seen the the 2017. Uh, which was WMT is an international evaluation of machine translation. It's a popular one. Uh, they have. Uh, it's very interesting. You you get. I mean, it's it's one of the top conferences in machine translation because it's not a workshop anymore. It used to be a workshop. Now it's a conference. And uh, here you see the representation of the uh, neural machine translation, in particular uh, the University of Edinburgh. Uh, neural machine translation system in German English and in Czech English, and this is the the evaluation in human uh, human performance and on horizontal line the blue performance, and you see that the University of Edinburgh the neural machine translation performs the best one in the in these two tasks compared to phrase based system to syntax based systems that we have talked in the in the in the break. Uh, to some rule-based systems, so, okay, yeah. This is state of the art. Yo, what next? Um, well, there are still some slides, but since the, 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 the one after this, it's me again, and it's yeah. very short, uh, I'm going to, to explain it a little bit. These are the character-based uh, uh, neural machine translation. No? Uh, the, what I told you, know, that, that the motivation that, that, that oh, okay, word embeddings have been shown to boost the performance in many natural language processing tasks, but there, 
they're limited to the to the world representations no so the idea to get morphological information from words is is to use characters instead of words okay so that's uh, the main motivation for using characters instead of words the idea of using character word embeddings instead of word embeddings is that you we want to get information about the morphological so house is related to houses and I don't read is related to reading and whatever okay so to get this information for uh, highly morphological languages it's it would be important to get a, a, a character word embedding um, model uh, this uh, character word embedding model can be computed as follows so the the computation of each word starts with a character based embedding that associates each word with a sequence of vectors okay so instead of having one single vector for a word we have a matrix for a word okay for each character i have a vector this sequence of words is then processed with a uh, two convolutional filters and we do a max pooling uh, uh, every time we get a maximum we, we we have this value and then well, with this we would have already a character word embedding. So instead of having our word embedding based on words, would be a, a, word, a, a word embedding. We still have the word embedding as, as, as we use, but based on characters. And, but it has been shown that using these highway layers, which I'm not sure that you have seen in previous courses, but anyway, uh, it improves performance. It's a, a type of neural network. Okay? Uh, and it's simply because experimentally they have shown that, that it works better. Okay, this first, this architecture that I'm showing here, it was first shown for uh, language modeling uh, uh, in Kim et al. 2015, so quite new as well, everything is new here. Uh, and we have applied it to neural machine translation, okay? And the integration is simply uh, here we substitute this part, the, co the, the one K encoding and the, and the continuous word representation with this architecture. And this, this new uh, continuous representation, which is a word embedding but based on characters, is our input to the encoder recurrent neural network. Okay? And this has been shown better results in, in the sense, uh, you cannot read it, but I cannot read German any, anyway, so it just you can look at the slides and you will read it. Uh, is that you, you have this morphological advantage that you can get uh, morphological generalizations much better. Uh, this uh, character embedding, we have applied it in the source, but it has already been applied in the source and in the target. And well, it helps in, the, in this, in, in, uh, mainly in the, in the morphological generalization. Another concept that has been applied recently to machine translation, but it's still until development, are these generative adversarial networks, okay, that it is a very hot topic. Uh, uh, I mean, and very difficult to make them train. But the idea of the generative adversarial networks is that you put two networks to compete, okay? So you have one network that makes your translation, in this case, and then from this uh, translation, you want to discriminate if this is a machine translation or a human translation, okay? So you have this other discriminative network that compares your output with, with, a, with a, well, and decides if, the, uh, if, the, if it's a human or a machine translation. And the idea is that um, uh, the, the, the generator network has to fool the discriminative network and the discriminator does not have to be fooled by the generative. Okay, and you put these two networks to compete. And this is the way that your uh, generator, which is your translation, <coughs> translation system, improves because of this feedback from the discriminative. Okay. Another trend is this multilingual translation that I have already talked at the beginning. Okay, is that okay? This is, uh, I I love this topic. Uh, I mean is the idea that you, want, you can find, since we are doing a representation in the middle, we are doing, an with the encoder, we do a, a representation, can we train this universal language space? 
okay? Can we train it like a desired interlingua, okay? When you talk about interlingua, people tend to think about Esperanto or to think about rule-based systems, but no, this would be an automatic interlingua, okay? So, uh, really, it does exist such a concept a space. So, um, I have a nice, ah, here, yeah, I have it. Uh, this was one experiment by Google, okay, that uh, he, they trained with a lot of uh, source languages and a lot of target languages, one single system, okay? And they had, uh, they didn't have parallel text, I think it was for Korean Japanese, okay? But since the Korean was in the source part and the Japanese was in the target part, they could, the system could learn some Korean Japanese translation, okay? So this was without uh, having parallel text, they could do a, a translation, okay? And this, they showed that there seemed to be some kind of interlingua. Let me explain you this graph. The idea is that here, what we have is uh, the plot of the same sentence in English, Korean, and Japanese, okay? And uh, the, the, the one in the same color is, is, is the same sentence, and the same sentence is represented, the same sentence in English, Korean, and Japanese is represented in the same point of the, of the, of, of the graph, or I, uh, of, the, of the map, okay? So they are nearby, okay? It seems like the, there, there is like some kind of interlingua, uh, the, in, the representation that we are doing in English, Korean, and Japanese, if it's the same sentence, it goes to the same point in the space, okay? So it seems that it could exist, this concept space. But still, this is an ongoing, an, an ongoing line of research, okay? So a summary of this talk, is that machine translation is fate as, as a sequence to sequence problem, because it's a sequence to sequence problem. Uh, the source sentence is encoded into a fixed length vector and decoded in the most probable target sentence. This is not true anymore when you apply attention, okay? It's not a fixed length vector. Uh, uh, but well, uh, you do a, a representation of the source sentence, that's true. And, and then you need parallel corpus and automatic evaluation to build your neural machine translation system. Thanks to the attention-based mechanism, you, you achieve the state of the art. B before the encoder-decoder architecture, just with recurrent neural networks was not state of the art. The first one was when uh, we, uh, we used, uh, well, it was used the attention-based mechanism and many progress is still going on in machine translation, in using characters, using multilinguality, using attention-based mechanisms, uh, many, many things that, that the field is really exploiting. Okay, so that's all for this lecture.